So thank you for coming along this afternoon and welcome to our talk celebrating Scots women who chose to challenge. We'll take a wander through archive material on Scran to meet Scots women who've made their mark in their respective fields, whether in politics, law, medicine, the arts or the world of sport. We'll introduce you to some well-known faces and perhaps you'll meet a few lesser known but nonetheless inspiring individuals who chose to challenge their world. For example, here we can see Jenny Lee, politician and minister for the arts, looking at a pro-suffragette poster in 1968. Um, as Joe has said, I'm part of the learning and inclusion team here at HES, and I work mainly with the archival records found on scram.ac.uk. And as we has been mentioned, um, happy to answer questions afterwards about Scran and HES uh, archives in general, including Camel. Uh, a brief overview, Scran um, provides access to online digital archives and collections and over 300 institutions have uh, contributed content to the huge database um, um, in the course of its life of over 25 years um, and access is free. So without further ado, let's go meet just some of those Scottish women who chose to challenge. As you know, Oh, sorry, you know you're in for a good time when you encounter the good women of Seacliff near North Berwick in 1911. Pictured here, pushing the boundaries by cycling and smoking. As you can imagine, it was difficult to shortlist, uh, but today we'll be spending some time with Elsie, Crystal, Phyllis, Mary, Jenny, Margaret, Wilhelmina, Nancy, Muriel, and Winnie. However, along the way, we'll also be meeting other great Scots women out and about. Our first Scots woman who chose to challenge is, of course, Dr. Elsie Ingalls. She was a pioneer of female suffrage and medical care for women. Born in India, 1864, she returned to Edinburgh aged 14 to complete her schooling. In 1886, she first enrolled at the Edinburgh School of Medicine for Women, an institution established under the influence of Sophia Jex Blake, whom you may have heard of. The position of women as medical professionals was still not fully recognised, so Ingalls was unable to do her practical training at Edinburgh's Royal Infirmary. Instead, she had instruction at Leith Hospital and then Glasgow. By 1899, Edinburgh University relaxed its regulations and she was finally able to graduate as a fully qualified doctor after 13 years. After a spell as a house surgeon in London, further postgraduate study in Dublin and the US, Ingalls returned again to Edinburgh. Amongst other initiatives, Ingalls then helped found a hospice at Peacock's Land in 1904. If Ingalls had only achieved this much, her contribution in Scotland would, alone would have been considerable. However, during World War I, she diverted her efforts elsewhere. Convinced that women could play an important part she offered the War Office a hospital unit staffed by women, but she was rejected. Of course, this did not deter Ingalls, who went on to establish Scottish women's hospitals, entire, entirely staffed by nurses, Scottish women and doctors, as well as other female volunteers. This collection box was used to raise funds for the units, if you look closely, you can see the initials NUWSS, National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, on the box, just above the word help. Showing one connection between women's war work 
and women's politics. The medals pictured belong to Dr. Isabel Emsley, who commanded the Scottish Women's Hospital in Serbia. Here we see Ingalls working in the field with a patient around 1916 in Serbia. When the war forced the evacuation of hospitals, she remained with immobile patients and was herself taken prisoner. She was later released and repatriated in 1917. Undaunted, Ingalls set out to establish a new unit on the Russian front, but was forced by the revolution to return to Britain. Terminally ill, she died soon after arrival in Newcastle in 1917, aged 53. She is buried in the Dean Cemetery in Edinburgh. After the hospital movement she founded was disbanded, the remaining funds, plus monies from a wider public appeal in Edinburgh, led to the opening of a hospital named after her, the Elsie Ingalls Memorial Maternity Hospital, which opened in 1925. Here we see Sister Thompson, assistant matron with a patient on the veranda of the maternity hospital around 1930. Note the restorative view of Salisbury Crags in the distance. The Elsie Ingalls Memorial Pavilion remained as a maternity hospital until it closed amidst protest in 1988. This banner was last carried on the 17th of October that year when the hospital closed at a demonstration outside St Andrew's House. It would take a long time before such modern female health and maternity care would benefit women such as these, the hard-working woman of Cromarty's Fisher Town, pictured around 1910. Our second Scotswoman who chose to challenge is Crystal Macmillan. She was a suffragist, a feminist, a peace activist, and a barrister. Born in 1872 to Jessie Christie Finlayson and John Macmillan, an Edinburgh tea merchant, Macmillan was one of nine children, and as you can see, the only girl. She was educated in St Andrews and the University of Edinburgh, where she was the first female science graduate in 1896. Later, she was also the first female graduate to earn a first class honours in mathematics and natural philosophy. Macmillan is pictured here at a suffrage summer school she was active in the Edinburgh National Society for Women's Suffrage, the ENSWS. And between 1913 and 1920, she was also secretary for the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. Macmillan campaigned tirelessly for women's rights throughout her life, contributing to the peace process that followed World War I becoming an envoy for the Women's International League for Peace and was involved in the founding of the League of Nations. Macmillan tried but did not succeed in getting the League to establish nationality for women independent of the nationality of their husbands. She went on to become a barrister, qualifying in 1924, an advocate for women's rights, lobbying the International Labour Office to give women equal pay and opportunities in her work in the workplace. Today, her legacy is enshrined in the Edinburgh University building that bears her name. Such important work would be all too familiar to these two suffragettes campaigning on Alfred Street in Stromness, Orkney around 1913. Our third Scotswoman who chose to challenge is Phyllis Mary Bone, born in 1894 and died in 1972. Bone was born in Lancashire but grew up in Edinburgh and studied at Edinburgh College of Art, as well as under the animal sculptor Edouard Nevalier in Paris. She's pictured here in the Solway Firth in 1960. 
This is the Scottish National War Memorial within Edinburgh Castle, designed by architect Robert Lorimer, who worked with over 200 artists to transform a former barracks into a remembrance hall and create a shrine. During the 20s, Bone established her reputation with her contribution to the memorial, for which she was responsible for modelling all but one of the animals among other sculptural work. If you have ever visited, you may recall her work. Bone was chosen to sculpt the heads of various beasts of burden who served and died alongside the soldiers. Cast your eyes upwards in the Hall of Honour and you will see her work, including camels, horses, pigeons. One carving at your feet, which is e easy to miss, is that of the mice and the canaries, who were, of course, the tunnelers' friends. Seen here in context. Here are two further examples, the horse and the donkey, from her monument, Remember also the humble beasts. Bone left her animal tracks on another of Edinburgh's landmarks. In 1920, King George laid the foundation stone opening the University of Edinburgh's new science campus, namely King's Buildings. Note the series of sculpted roundels between the windows. Taking a closer look, this detail contains an aardvark and above is a crab, adorning the facade of the building, then the Department of Zoology. Phyllis Bone also adorned the entrance of, the, of St Andrew's House, built from 1936 to 39. Her lion and unicorn relief sculptures are above the main entrance to St Andrew's House the then Scottish office seat of government. This is the Royal Scottish Academy Selection Committee, a somewhat male gathering. During a prolific career, Bone presented a bronze sculpture, Sheer Khan the Tiger, to the Royal Scottish Academy's diploma collection in 1930. This being a requirement of being elected to the ranks of the Academy. Subsequently, Bone became the first woman to be elected as a full member of the Royal Scottish Academy, the RSA, in 1944. She exhibited at the RSA annual exhibition 55 times between 1915 and her death in 1972. Bone had also played her part during World War I serving as a driver in the Women's Legion. She was in the company of many other pioneering women. And here we see WAC, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, carpenters at work in France. This leads us to our fourth Scotswoman who chose to challenge. Mary Chisholm, born 1896, died 1981. Here she wears her medal after being honoured by Belgium during World War I. Mary Chisholm had been an experienced motorcyclist even before World War I and had met Elsie Knocker through their shared racing passion. They were close friends, spending most of the war living together on the front line. Often fundraising, they became two of the most photographed women of the time. Mary Chisholm had no professional medical training, but learned in the field from Knocker, who was a qualified nurse. Together, they set up a surgery in the cellar of a ruined house near Flanders on the front line. Workspace was limited, so the cellar also served as their accommodation for their time in purveys. From her papers, this image shows the condition Mary Chisholm worked in the surgery. Under constant threat of a gas attack, the doctors and nurses had to wear gas masks at all times. Chisholm and Knocker became known as the Madonnas of Purveys. In 1915, their reputation for bravery 
retrieving wounded soldiers under sniper fire, led them to being awarded a medal from the Belgian King. And by the end of the war, they had received a total of 17 medals, including the British Military Medal. This contemporary photograph of Pervaise gives us a vivid impression of the conditions. They lived under the threat of artillery bombardment at all times. Mary Chisholm and Knocker's time here came to an end in 1918, when they both were gassed. They had to go home. Chisholm recovered enough to return to the front. After the war, Chisholm discovered that Knocker was a divorcee and abandoned their friendship, having limited contact. Mary Chisholm returned to her favourite hobby, motor car and motorbike racing. Chisholm is seen here wearing her woman's Royal Air Force uniform around 1918, when the RAF was just newly formed. When World War II broke out, she once again joined the war effort. Despite ill health, she became a member of the WAF, the Women's Air Auxiliary Air Force. Later in life, she returned to live in Nairn for a spell, running a poultry farm, then Jersey, and finally relocating to Argyll. She died from lung cancer in 1981 in Perth Hospital. Of course, there were other women involved in early aviation. These World War I maintenance crews were employed on SOP with biplanes at East Fortune Airdrome in 1918. Our fifth woman who chose to challenge is Jenny Lee. Lee was a charismatic socialist and one of the most outstanding women in British politics. Seen here speaking at the Labour Party conference, Margate, 1947. Lee was born in Loch Gelly in Fife, 1904. She came from a traditional mining family, a working class woman. Her father was a chairman of the local independent Labour Party. And from a young age, she accompanied him to meetings and heard leading socialists like James Maxton speak. She's pictured here in the 20s with Maxton and Chinese delegate, Mr. Tang Lee. Grant funded, Lee studied at the University of Edinburgh, graduating in education and law. Age 24, she became the youngest member of parliament, representing North Lanark in 1927 for the ILP, the Independent Labour Party. She's pictured here in 1946, talking to constituents of the village of Norton Keynes in the Cannock Chase Coalfield. In 1934, she married Welsh politician Anurin Bevan. In the 1945 general election, Jenny Lee won the mining constituency of Cannock. Incidentally, in that government, Lee's husband, Bevan, was appointed Minister for Health and is regarded as the father of the National Health Service. After the 1964 general election, Lee was appointed Britain's first ever arts minister. She doubled arts spending and was responsible for setting up the Open University. She retired from the House of Commons in 1970, when she was created Baroness Lee of Ashridge. Jenny Lee died in 1988. Pictured in 1925, I'd like to imagine these Bonnie Bridge Brickworks employees were aware of Jenny Lee's basic labour principles. Our sixth Scotswoman who chose to challenge is architect Margaret Brash Brodie. Born in 1907 in Largs, Ayrshire, she was the daughter of a civil engineer and she studied at Glasgow School of Art Architecture. She's one of the first fully qualified women architects in Scotland, graduating in 1928. I wish to highlight that this image does not come from Scran or HES archives 
and I'd like to thank Robin Webster of Webster Architects for allowing me to include it in my presentation. In 1938, here we see the opening ceremony of Paisley's new Infectious Diseases Hospitals Hospital at Hawk Head. After qualification, Brodie worked on the design for this hospital. Her drawings for the scheme brought her to the intention of respected architect Thomas Tate. Subsequently, she worked on the Glasgow Empire Exhibition, for which she supervised the construction on site of the infrastructure for around 150 different buildings and personally designed the Women of Empire Pavilion. The Empire Pavilion artist's impressions were used to illustrate a series of 25 cigarette cards, of which this is number 22 and shows Brodie's pavilion. These cards are some of the few surviving coloured records of the Empire exhibition. This is the Women's Pavilion at the Empire Exhibition by Brodie. She received great praise from architectural critics at the time for her planning. To the left can be seen the exposed trusses that carried the roof of the fan-shaped fashion theatre. And to the right, the glazed exhibition space housed a curved display of the history of fashion. Inside the 400-seat fan-shaped theatre, Mannequins paraded the latest in British fashion. The ceiling was created by yards of stretched fabric. The History of Fashion exhibition featured 100 costumes in a long circular gallery and a splendid VIP reception room. This apparently modest building won great praise. Throughout the run of the Empire exhibition, over 100,000 people paid the entrance fee to see the daily mannequin shows. And I can see why, worth every penny in my opinion. During World War II, Brodie worked in East Anglia, designing aerodromes for the Air Ministry and later returned to Scotland. She established her own architectural practice in 1949. Much of her work was on Scotland's historic architecture, particularly churches, and rural domestic vernacular buildings. Brodie became a fellow of the Glasgow School of Art in 1995 and passed away in 1997. Moving on to this, a favourite archive from Scran. She could be considered a homegrown interpretation of the iconic American Rita the Riveter. I refer to this unknown woman as Doris the Docker. She featured in the picture post in 1952. The feature was called A Ship is Born on the British India Company passenger liner, Uganda, built on the Clyde side. Our seventh Scotswoman who chose to challenge is artist Wilhelmina Barnes Graham. After graduating from Edinburgh College of Art, Barnes Graham moved to St Ives in Cornwall around 1940. There she became an integral member of the St Ives Society of Artists, alongside famous names like Barbara Hepworth and Ben Nicholson. This painting shows the beginnings of the simplification of forms and textures which would define her future work. This 1954 painting called Composition C shows Barnes Graham's move into abstraction in the 1950s. She became known for her use of pattern, colour and textures found in natural forms, the sea and landscapes. In 1960, she inherited Balmungo House and split her time between Fife and Cornwall. Here we see her working on Progression to St Ives in 1966. Drawing was how Barnes Graham connected with the natural world and her environment. In the 70s and 80s, she further explored shapes and energies of the shore in this way, as, sign, as seen in this piece entitled Breaker from 1976. 
Here she is observing and drawing on a beach in Fife in 1982. Her life's work contributed to the advancement of British abstract art in 20th century. She gained much recognition towards the end of her life in particular, receiving honorary doctorates from various universities, including St Andrews University. She was also awarded a CBE. And Barnes Graham is seen here working at Balmungo House St Andrews around 1992. Still true to her abstract approach, in 1999, Barnes Graham was commissioned by King's College, Cambridge, to create a print for fundraising. She made one for the college and the second version called Summer Brackets Yellow for herself, which is a joyful piece. Barnes Graham died in 2004. Today, her legacy continues to provide grants and funding to support young people to fulfill their potential and education in the visual arts through the Wilhelmina Barnes Graham Charitable Trust. Also full of potential, here is a force to be reckoned with, the St Cuthbert's Cooperatives Women's Guild and Education Committee, 1925. By 1959, St Cuthbert's had over 30 branches of the Women's Guild. They organised a cooperative day pageant and are pictured in front of the Children's Circle float. A meeting was held in 1894 by members of the Educational Committee of St Cuthbert's, some of whom happened to be women, to discuss the setting up of a Women's Guild. 65 women joined on the first night and went from strength to strength. Our eighth Scotswoman who chose to challenge is swimmer Nancy Reich. Born in 1927, Reich learned to swim at Motherwell Baths. Despite her initial fear of water, she became a vital member of Motherwell Amateur Swimming and Water Polo Club. In 1946, she was British champion in the 100 yards, 220 yards and 440 yards freestyle. This 1942 photographs shows Reich left with Harry Lauder in the centre and a Dutch swimmer called Van Ouden, who Reich defeated. At this time, the reputation of Nancy Reich and the Motherwell team was rising rapidly. She became the most famous swimmer in wartime and helped entertain civilian population and the forces at galas across Britain. In 1947, Reich won gold at the World Youth Games and bronze at the European Championships, but collapsed after one of the heats. At the age of 20, Reich had contracted polio and tragically died in Monte Carlo. Her death stunned the nation and 10,000 people lined the streets at her funeral. At one time, Nancy Reich held every Scottish record at every distance, in every stroke. In 1949, the Scottish Amateur Swimming Association established the Nancy Reich Memorial Medal. It is awarded annually to the person who has done the most to enhance or uphold the prestige of Scottish swimming. Reich was inducted into the Scottish Sports Hall of Fame in 2002 and the Scottish Swimming Hall of Fame in 2010. Here we see more sporting prowess in the form of the Leith ladies football team playing away at Kirkcaldy in 1938. Our ninth Scotswoman who chose to challenge is of course the mighty Muriel Spark. Born in Edinburgh 1918, she attended James Gillespie's School for Girls, where she won a poetry competition to mark the centenary of the death of Sir Walter Scott. 
Her first books were biographical studies of Wordsworth and Mary Shelley. However, she began writing novels in the late 1950s. Her fiction includes 24 novels, and in general, she did not write about Scotland, but it is the exception to this which has proved her best known work, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie of 1961. This image shows the STV filming a television adaption in 1977. In 1967, Spark received an OBE. Pictured here in 1989, she accepted an honorary degree from the University of Edinburgh. And in 1993, she became a Dame of the British Empire. She died in Italy in 2006, but her writing continues to inspire. Perhaps part of the creme de la creme, this is Miss Lethem, Mrs. Milson, and Lady Allness in 1932, playing at the Scottish Gulf foursomes at Cruden Bay in Aberdeenshire. Our 10th and final Scotswoman who chose to challenge is politician Winnie Ewing, born in Glasgow, 1929. Sadly, Winnie Ewing passed away recently on the 22nd of June this year, aged 93. In 1946, Ewing matriculated at the University of Glasgow and joined the SNP at the same time, proceeded to qualify as a solicitor. Here she's pictured at Waverley Station in 1967. As a politician, she shot to fame in 67, when in a shock result for the Labour Party, this energetic young mother took the seat of Hamilton in the by-election, which Overton turned a previously safe majority. She's pictured arriving at the House of Commons with her three children. Winifred Ewing became Vice President of the SNP in 1979 and President in 1987. She became known as Madame Ecos because of her devotion to Scottish causes in European politics. Following a remarkable career, Ewing retired in 2003 after realising a lifetime's ambition of reconvening the first Scottish Parliament in 1999. The Ewing clan, of course, has become something of an institution in Scottish politics. Here, the working women of Aberdeen weren't afraid to make themselves heard when protesting in 1967. Like all the women we've met today, they imagined a gender equal world. Equality is a goal and equity the means in getting there. Hoping you have found this archival look at some of our great Scots women worthwhile. Before I say goodbye, I'd like to invite you to follow us on social media at Scran Life on Twitter or X and Facebook, where I post daily to celebrate and share interesting archives.